Okay, uh, we're good to go. Okay, well, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, this is titled A Critical Look at the Coding Standards Landscape. Um, who here thinks they know what coding standards are? Okay, good. Yeah, some maybe. Um, how many of you think you know uh, what makes a coding standard a good coding standard? A few less people, right? Um, how many of you know more than two different coding guidelines or coding standards or are familiar with? Okay. How about five? Okay. How many of you have a, a company specific or a private set of coding guidelines that you use that aren't public? A lot of people. Okay, good. So now I get it. Now I have some information about the audience. Uh, if, if you're watching this later on video, feel free to raise your hands too. I, you know, I don't know. If that will help, let me close this thing. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so first, if, if you are watching this on the video later, um, I'm highly recommending that you go and watch these other presentations first that deal with coding standards and coding guidelines. These happened earlier in the week. Um, I had a, a bit of a problem of choosing, like figuring out which ones to choose. Because really, if you think about it, the whole point of the conference is we're, we're providing guidance Right, so really every talk is about guidelines to the community, right? But these talks were specifically about coding standards that exist or, or, or how we treat them. They're kind of meta about coding standards. So please go so the, see these if you haven't already. If you're here in the audience and you didn't watch them, you should watch these later afterward. Okay, so some personal context. So I know some about you. You should know some about where I'm coming from. So I, I first learned C, C++ in the year 2000. Um, but um, I have a personal vendetta. Um, that is not a thing. C slash C++ is not a thing. If somebody's teaching C slash C++, they're not teaching you anything that is real, okay? It's C and C++, right? So. What's interesting here is I still have both of those on the same line of the year 2000. Yes? When you look at the language, I agree. But then we look from a build system perspective, it's really the same ah, thing. Right. So the, the point is, when we look at a language, the, 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 the attendee agrees. Uh, but when you look at build systems and tooling and stuff, uh, they share almost everything. And that's a good point. Uh, the reason that these are still on the same line, though, and I wouldn't mind talking to SD, uh, to the education study group about it or a particular presenter uh, that's here at the conference. Um, I learned C and C++ concurrently at the same time. So I don't know how common that is, but it, it, it provided a unique perspective about the differences between these things. And that's my vendetta against that term. Um, a few years later, I was teaching C++ courses to undergraduate students. Uh, just another year later, I was working in industry doing enterprise C++ applications. And then in 2007, sort of my, my path on my, my career changed, right? I went to SD West in 2007, and I attended Bjarne Strustrup and Herb Sutter's pre-conference uh, pre course that they offered, Strustrup and Sutter on C++. And you know, I knew C++, but really I didn't really know C++ before then. Uh, but this changed my, my outlook. I decided here I wanted to be doing C++ code. So these conferences where we learn things about C++ do have the potential to transform your career, right? And so I, I just wanted to point that out for people who are the first time. Find something you're passionate about and, and go towards it. Uh, so a few years later, I began participating in the standards committee, uh, published some papers, started going to, comp uh, going to committee meetings. And then in 2016, I started working on static analysis at Synopsys. Uh, Synopsys, you may be more familiar with it as the name Coverity. It was Coverity, they had a product, but they were bought by Synopsys. So if I use Synopsys, replace that in your head with Coverity. If you use the word Coverity, replace that in your speech with Synopsys. Um, but this is what I wanted to do in 2007. I said, I want to work on C++, so that's what I'm doing now. And just, you know, a little bit after I started there, 
we actually begin implementing static analysis rules, uh, checks for those uh, for various industry standard coding guidelines, coding standards. Okay, enough about me. Um, so what is a coding guideline versus a coding standard? Does anyone want to offer their opinion? No, okay, well, there's been presentation, there's been other presentations where they had input on this. I'm gonna give you my take on it. A coding guideline is a collection of rules that encourage or discourage the use of language or library features, patterns of code, and or programming practices. The one that I haven't really seen too many people include in this definition is programming practices. It's perfectly reasonable to have a guideline that says run stack analysis, write tests, use CI. Those, that, that's a part of our jobs. It's perfectly valid for those to show up in a guideline. The difference between a guideline and a coding standard, in my opinion, is that a coding standard is a guideline that's been broadly adopted, often with the imprimatur of a respected or trusted organization or individual. So, if I have my own coding guideline, I've, ri I've written it up and I put it on GitHub. Is that a coding standard under this definition? No, it's not. Who's using it? Me? Maybe a few other people? But if the um, C++ ISO, ISO Foundation is backing a coding guideline and they put it out there, I would contend that that is a standard, right? It may not be an officially approved and international treaty level standard, but it is a standard, it's a de facto standard. Okay, any questions so far? No, great. Um, so there was no, some of the other presentations again, um, had lists of different style guidelines or safety critical um, standards, right? So this is my incomplete list. Uh, it overlaps some with other people. We got a whole lot of currently active standards that you, or guidelines that you can find out on the web. Um, if you find the slides of this later, these are links, they're active, you can go and see them. Uh, some of them are hierarchical, so Google has one. Absil derives basically from that. So does Chromium, and then there's another one called Blink. Um, some of these are put out by organizations, some by companies. Um, some of them are just people, like Scott Myers and Jason Turner's C++ Best Practices, which is a GitHub repo that you can fork. It's very nice. Uh, we have some older ones that might be out of date because things have changed since they were originally published. Um, you know, Herb's and uh, uh, Andre's C++ Coding Standards, is, they're really good, but they've also been dated. Things have changed since then. So just because it's old doesn't mean there's nothing good in them. It means that you should remember that they were written in a different period of time and take that into account when you're interpreting them. And then there are what I would call historical ones, ones that really aren't in effect anymore. The oldest one I found was this Elemtel uh, programming rules. Anybody familiar with that one? Uh, uh, yep, it was, it was out of a Swedish company. Um, this was published in 1992. Uh, this link is still active. What is this? It's IPA from Japan. IPA from Japan. Like I said, it's incomplete, okay. right? Uh, does anybody else have any other ones that that are that you know of that are missing up here that aren't your company guidelines or such? Elements of programming style. Elements of programming style. Who's the author? Okay, Kernigan. Okay. All right. All right. So the big question is, why do we have guidelines? Why, what's What's the purpose? Does anyone want to offer suggestions of why we, why do these things exist? Titus. Okay. Right. A starting point to allow you to not think of all the details and still allow you to maintain a certain level of quality in the, in the code base. Yes. Okay, to avoid common errors so that when you pull in somebody new from a different place that they won't make errors in your code base, uh, right? That's basically it. Yes? They codify experience. They, co avoid they codify experience, things to avoid because they're dangerous. That's an interesting one because sometimes our experiences can be misleading, but it's still good. Okay, so 
um, I contend that there's a set of things that you're trying to achieve whenever you make a set of guidelines, right? You want clarity in your code. Um, it's been often said that code is read far more often than it's written, right? So there might be guidelines uh, that are emphasizing the reading of the code, right? And that might be their only purpose, right? A lot of times name, when you use naming things, you're doing it for this reason. You might be future-proofing things. You might be future-proofing it against new employees, new, new participants in your code base. Um, you might be future-proofing it from yourself. Uh, and, you, know, you don't want to accidentally add a line under an, a conditional if there's no braces, right? That's not the right thing to do. You might have constraining factors in your, in your environment that you need to meet. Things like a function must execute within a certain given amount of time, and that's its upper limit. It, it has to finish in that amount of time. Or you may have a limited amount of memory, so you may not be able to allocate dynamically during your program's execution. You might have guidelines for those reasons. You might be concerned about making sure that the behavior of your application is well known. There's no undefined behavior. The compiler is not going to do something funny and tricky uh, and give you behavior that you weren't expecting. I would also say that this probably also includes unexpected behavior. There are lots of features in the language that um, a programmer might believe behave a certain way, but they behave a very different way. Portability. You might be targeting multiple platforms. And in those cases, you might actually have rules about how you write your code so that, and organize your code, so that you can do this in a reasonable amount of time and maintain the level of quality in the product. And you might actually have guidelines that affect how you write code so that they interact with tooling in certain ways, right? So for instance, if you're using um, uh, something, an auto formatting tool, like, like Clang has, uh, you might have a guideline that says, don't worry about, don't sweat the details of the, of, of the formatting while you're writing the code. The, the tool will automatically take care of formatting it the right way for you in the end, right? And that's a guideline. Uh, this is not necessarily a complete list. This is the ones that I think are important. Yes? Yes, there might be a guideline that says run this tool before you commit. Any other, any other, anybody else think of any other sort of reasons, goals behind guidelines? Pablo. In a way, kind of encompassing all of this is establishing a common culture around the code. Right, so you want to establish um, a culture, a common culture around your code base um, so that the people that are participants in that culture can easily understand what's going on in that culture. Becca? Just tying into what he said, you want to facilitate collaboration and working as a team. Right. You want to facilitate collaboration and working as a team. There's, a, there's another one I, I, just, I just thought of. Uh, you want to eliminate ridiculous arguments. <laughs> right? We can get into camps and we can spend an inordinate amount of time arguing about ridiculous things where you just pick one and that's it. The, the problem is solved. Okay, so we're going to talk about ways that rules can, things that rules use to achieve those goals. Uh, I would like to point, I would like to say though, there's nothing in, there's nothing in this talk really that I'm not, I'm not going to try, I'm not going to try to bash or say uh, those are bad guidelines, these are good, good guidelines, right? I'm not here, I'm not picking sides for guidelines. We're examining what makes them good and what makes them bad. There will be examples from different things, but, okay. So techniques. So you might have rules that are concerned about formatting, right? Uh, come on. So these are guidelines that specify that the way the code looks on the screen. Um, examples are where you put your braces, what kind of white space you're using, where do white space show up, what's your line width, things like that. So an example of this, um, is this guideline right here. This is from the Splash Damage, Splash Damage Live C++ coding standards that Valentin um, talked about earlier in the week. Uh, this is just saying, oh yeah, you, sh you should strive for an 80 character line width 
And okay, 100 character might be okay, but, but those are your guidelines, right? So this is a formatting rule. Presumably, I'm guessing that it's probably intended to, to help with clarity, right? There's also links. Each one of these uh, examples has a link to hopefully an actual commit hash so that if things change, you can still get to the right one. Yes? Yeah. Right, it's a, it's a clarity thing. So the idea is that the column width helps you compare things side by side. Yeah. Organization. So guidelines that specify elements of code are organized in the project. Um, but this isn't, you know, um, necessarily even um, like in the code itself, right? So it might be how many namespaces are you allowing? Uh, it might be how, how, what's the complexity of a function? How many lines can, should a function be? Uh, it might be if you have a bunch of headers, some of them are intended to be public and some are private, how do you lay those out on disk? It's organizing your code. Guidelines can, can tell you that. It might say have a single class in each source file, each, each, trend, you know, each CPP file. Or it might say, always put your class accessibilities in the following order. And so that's this example. This example is from the Joint Strike Fighter Air Vehicle Rules um, that Vyarna was heavily involved in. And it just says, uh, yeah, you, you will declare them in public, protected, private in that order. All right, that's this rule. Okay, we're gonna come back to this one a little bit later. Um, you might have rules that use naming to achieve things. So this specifies how files and elements in code are named. Um, you know, do you have a convention for how you name your files? Um, do you use Hungarian notation for your code? Um, are there prefixes that go on all of your classes or functions that are specific to your library? Maybe if you're not using namespaces, maybe you want to use that to demarcate, this is, this is a absolute function or something, right? Uh, casing, for example, Pascal case, Nate case, there's a whole bunch of options. Um, anyone want to guess what this example is from? Without reading it? Peter? What's it from? Right. So this, this is actually a paper that has resulted after the last standards committee meeting that was in Cologne. The last standards committee meeting, the committee decided to change the casing of the standard concepts that appear in C++ 20 from Pascal case to snake case. And this paper has been since submitted to the committee for review, hopefully at the next meeting. Um, and there's one particular part of it I want to point out. And I'll read it. To tackle this problem, LEWG created guidelines for naming concepts to minimize name conflicts. This paper refines them and proposes to add them to the upcoming LEWG policy standing document. Very interesting, right? I'll come back to something about this later too, I think. Okay, you might use explicitness in your rules. So, guidelines that require or prefer behavior to be explicitly written in situations where it otherwise might not be required. So, you know, whenever we declare something, we give it a type and a name, right? Um, but we're tempted now to use auto, right? There might be a rule that says, no, 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 auto is confusing to readers. Prefer, prefer concrete types uh, whenever you're declaring things in local scope. That could be a rule. Um, the rule of five, right? It says, be explicit about all of the special member functions and what their behavior is. If you, if you do one of them, you know, if you declare one of them, declare all of them. And then rules about whether virtual and override keywords appear in the signatures of virtual functions. So here's an example of one. This is from the C++ core guidelines. It says, you should use exactly one of virtual override or final. Um, different guidelines would differ on this, right? But this is just what they have. This is an example of using explicitness in the rule to achieve a particular goal. Uh, the rule might restrict what features you use. This is a very common one. It turns out there are lots of um, features that can be dangerous if you don't use them right. So prohibit or discourage language or library features. So you can say um, all your format strings for printf, they cannot, they cannot be mutable 
they, they have to be they have to be constant. Um, does anybody know why that would be why that's an important rule? Security. Security. What particular? You can just format string. You could read it into the pointer or something like. That. Right. It's a format string attack. If you have a mutable, changeable string as a format string, an attacker might be able to manipulate the value of that, but then lets them explore the space around your stack and discover the flaws that you might have in your program. Uh, we discovered this, I don't know, about 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, you don't use I.O. streams. They're slow. Right? That might be a rule. Uh, no dynamic memory allocation. I mentioned that earlier. You might have a rule that says no exceptions. Right? So this is probably the most well-known and somewhat controversial rule in, in, uh, in these. Uh, this is from the Google style, C++ style guideline. Uh, you know what I really like about this guideline? It's simple. <laughs> it's straightforward. There's no, well, what about this or interpreted this, right? It says we do not use C++ exceptions, right? Now, I may have just not included the rationale, right? I should point out too, having a rationale for, for these rules are an important thing and we'll come to that again later. Feature promotion. You might, your rules might say, there's this great new feature. It increases the performance or the safety of the things in the language. So use those. Um, you know, using exceptions. I have a guideline that says, use exceptions for errors that are you know, exceptional, right, that you can recover from. Uh, almost always auto. That's a prescription to use a feature of the language. Uh, using concepts. In, in, the dec in the declarations of, of your templates. So this is another C++ core guideline. Uh, specify concepts for all template arguments. They go on to say that, well, if concepts isn't really available yet, you can simulate it by doing this, but the principle is, is, is the same, right? Using specified concepts um, in your template for all your template arguments. And then you might have behavioral prescriptions. These are actually my favorite class of them. Um, Specify behaviors that developers should embrace or avoid. It's a very broad <laughs> tool, right? So things like use source control, enable more warnings, treat the warnings as errors because there, there's a reason it's warning you about it. Write tests, compile with multiple compilers. Turns out that if you compile with multiple compilers, you discover things that the other compilers didn't, right? And then using analysis tools, right? So. This guideline is actually from Jason Turner's C++ best practices guideline that is on, on his GitHub account. So he says, use static analyzers. Um, and th the first one in the list happens to be uh, this Coverity scan application, uh, which is a product that I am associated with. Um, again, uh, I might ask, I might actually send a pull request to Jason to change this to Synopsys, but uh, the name of the product is Coverity scan. It's a free, uh, scanning tool for open source applications. Uh, but we don't only offer free solutions. <laughs> uh, we, also, we also sell a really good static analysis product. Um, so if you're interested in, in a, a good solid static analysis product uh, with front ends for multiple, multiple languages, um, you can go to this, this URL. That's the obligatory plug. So. Okay, um, now's a good time for people to ask questions about all of that stuff, if you have any. Peter. In your experience, um, especially static analysis tools, checking guidelines, very often our interview is very late. Mm -hmm. And the feedback is very indirect. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience <coughs> on making that more direct? Um, have you experienced people that suffer from indirect feedback? Like, OK, I check in, and then I get an email with all my highlights. Right. Um, yes, I think that we should probably have a conversation about it <laughs> later. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, the question was, a lot of times with static analysis tools, uh, the feedback that users get comes much later after they've pushed or said, I want to test this code. And they get an email or something, but they've already moved off. They're doing something else. So the question was, what are my opinions on ways to make that um, a more uh, valid user experience to, to, to get into the workflow of how we actually do our work. Is that right, Peter? And I think we should come back to that um, at the end of, of the talk. You'll also see something 
in here, but yeah. Okay, so there, <laughs> all those things about how guidelines, what their goals are, how you can, what, what, what you tools you use to do them, um, but there are, there are some issues, right? So I'll, I'll let you kind of look at this and figure out, I, I've left it very, um, uh, not secretive, but I haven't put explanations on these, but these are some pictures I've, I've gotten for my presentation uh, from Creative Commons, so they're all attributed. Okay, <clears throat> so the wrong context. In this picture, we have a dog, a little tiny dog, uh, sitting amongst a bunch of little stuffed animal toy, or you know, stuffed toys and stuff. Uh, clearly, one of these things does not belong in this picture. <clears throat> so, a lot of guidelines are not intended to be generic guidelines, right? They, they may have specific constraints that they're concerned about, uh, that may be about the language or the domain that they're, that they're trying to target, right? Um, so, for instance, some domains have memory constraints or responsiveness or uptime requirements, for example, right? And a guideline might have rules to achieve those, those goals. But that doesn't mean that they're good rules for general purpose, right? So, try not to pick on anybody, but this is a good example. So, MISRA C++ 2008, the latest MISRA C++ standard. It has a context. The good thing is this guideline, this standard, tells you what the context is if you carefully read the document, right? So, these are a couple of sections that you can pull out. Uh, does anybody notice what kind of like pops out? Just scanning this stuff, not reading it, just scanning it. What, what do you kind of notice like pops in your face? Peter? Old C++ standard. Old C++ standard, right. So you've, you've gone one level beyond what most people would be able to. But you see these IEC 14882 colon 2003? That is the official document number, the ISO document number for a C++ standard. It is for the C++ 2003 standard. And I'll point them all out here. Right there. It talks about it a lot, right? So. The MISRA C++ 2008 standard is applicable only to C++03 code, okay? So if your product is using C++11 or anything later and you think you want to use MISRA C++ 2008 as a guideline, you're making a mistake. And I'll tell you why. Because as an implementer, we read these rules and then we have to figure out what they mean so we can go implement them. If a rule has some behavior that interacts with a new language feature, as an implementer, we have to decide what to do, right? Maybe we sort of extend the meaning of the rule to encompass the new language feature, right? Or maybe we say, you're using the new, you're new, using the new version of the language, we're, we're bailing, right? We're not gonna do anything, that's not a defect, right? So invariably what will happen is one customer will say, why didn't you report a defect or a violation here? And the other customer will say, why did you report a violation here, <laughs> right? And so if you do this, effectively what you're creating is undefined behavior in your tooling that's helping you. Not, not a good situation, right? But there's also an additional context uh, constraint in here that's kind of hidden. Does anybody see it? It's in the last paragraph. Michael, freestanding, come on. This document is aimed at a freestanding implementation. So if you're not using a free, who here is using a freestanding implementation in their product they're using? There's two hands, right? These are the only two people who should be considering MISRA C++ 2008 as a, as a coding standard to use, right? This, this is the context for this. If you're using this standard for something else, you're, you're maybe not strongly, as I, it's a little strong earlier mistake, you're, create, you're, you're creating problem for yourself. Okay, enough picking on this for C++. <laughs> um, it's you're not really picking on Mr. C++. They're very clear about what the context is for it, right? Timeliness, this has been talked about in some of the other talks. Uh, you have, to keep, you have to keep these standards updated, right? The environment changes. The context changes, right? New versions of the language, new versions of the tools, 
Um, what happens when the next format string attack or specter flaw is found? Is your, are your standards, your guidelines you're using, are they gonna get updated? Right, they should. So good guidelines are maintained regularly and evolve deliberately. Peter, yes. <clears throat> Right. We never are ready. Right. So Peter, Peter's, the gist of Peter's comment here is that it's a moving target. We're moving fast. Things are changing fast. And we're always going to be behind to some degree on, on guidelines, especially big standards that have to get approved, right, by, by a larger organizations. Michael. Right. Right. So, I would actually even think it's even more uh, controversial to say that the core guideline is greater than it is, it's almost even worse. Ah. Right. So, so, Michael's point here is that um, there's two ends of the spectrum, right? There are organizations who the tools and the environment that they're using, the context does move slowly. And then there are others on the other end where things are moving really fast. And so while something like Mr. C++ 2008 might be appropriate for one end and not the other, the C++ core guidelines are appropriate for one end and not the other, right? It's all about finding the, the right one for where you're at. Static guidelines, in my opinion, are bad. If you can't change the guidelines in response to the, the change in the environment, then those guidelines need to figure out a way to change that. I'm not going to say they should go away. They should figure out a way to make it better. Okay. Um, so another issue. Uninformed or rote action. I actually had to ask some questions about, I got advice on what to actually phrase this. Uh, and one that I didn't put on here, but I think was interesting, was um, uh, mindless mimicry. Uh, by, and, and Tony Van Eerd, uh gave me that one. Uh, so, developers who do not understand the rationale for a guideline will eventually misapply it, and they will do it repeatedly. Humans are great at overgeneralization, especially if they don't fully understand something. We general, we're, we're really great at generalizing. That's actually what has helped us survive all these thousands, millions of years, or however long, right? Um, we see some input, we generalize that, and then so when we see that input again, we know how to behave. Um, so some questions here, kind of open. Can a guideline be inferred from existing patterns in a code base? My contention is that it can. They're implicit. So I'm looking at authors and instructors and trainers. The material you're presenting forms an implicit guideline in your students' heads. They go, oh, that's how I write that thing. Yes. Right, so it's a blessing and a curse. People do things as they already exist. There's a certain inertia to things as they exist. In fact, some guidelines will tell you, okay, yeah, use these guidelines if you're writing new code, but if you jump into some other code base that doesn't follow these guidelines, just kind of do what they do, right? What they're telling you is follow the implicit guideline that's over there. You may have to figure it out on your own, but it's there. Okay, so. This is the Joint Strike Fighter air vehicle rule that we looked at earlier, okay? So I'm gonna put myself in the position of, of um, a, a new engineer. Uh, maybe they've used Java before or something, you know. Um, and I'm gonna read this and, you know, the public protected and private sections of the class will be declared in that order. Will be declared in that order, okay. Um, so I'm given a task to go make a, go make a function object that 
turn something by a certain number of degrees, right? So I go and I write, okay, uh, well, the public protected and private will appear in that order, right? So public, I, I put in public protected and private, and it's like, well, I've got all these accessibility things and a good object-oriented programming that I learned uh, t teaches me that member fields go with their private. Uh, but, oh wait, I'm gonna need to have access to that. So I'm gonna go write a getter and a setter, and I've got my, my function call operator. I, I'm, a new, I'm a newbie, right? This is, this is what I write. Okay, this is not what I would think most people would be consider to be ideal C++ code for that, that, that uh, unit. But, first, second, third, check mark, ship it. Right, I met, the, I met the coding standard, it's good, right? Obviously not. We would rather people not write getters and setters just because you can, right? So you, tell, you, give, you give me that feedback, and I go, okay, yeah, I'll remove the getters and setters, so I do this. Public, protected, private, right? I'm still, I'm still following the guideline, right? But really, I may have misinterpreted the guideline. It didn't say shall or must. It said will, right? So the question is, is it okay if I just do that? This is what, I, this is what an expert would have written if they were given that, that task, right? They would have looked at the rule and they would go, clearly this rule doesn't apply here. This is all public and this is all a public interface, right? Oh. Um, but I think there might be one thing wrong with this. Anybody know what it is? Nobody, okay. That's a rotate, okay. That's, that's a rotate, okay. So um, I'm gonna go and uh, make that a rotate. Okay, now we can ship it. This is why I asked earlier who all attended uh, uh, Sean Parent's keynote. Okay. So over-reliance. You may think that all these coding standards, they have so many rules, it must be that they're, they're, they're improving my software, right? So if they're improving my software and we're spending all this time on it, maybe, maybe I don't need to do some of the other things that we might would otherwise do. And that's a mistake. Uh, it's also a mistake to just treat your guidelines as a religious artifact that have been given to you upon high uh, and with no questioning. Right, that's an over that's a dependency that you shouldn't have in your organization. So, I did some I did some looking for research about how effective MISRA, in particular, rules are. Um, so I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this is a pretty critical. Um, this is a pretty critical. This is a research paper too. This isn't some guy on a blog. Right, this is a, a published research paper. I'll read the first line. In its present form, the only people to benefit from the MISRA C2004 update would appear to be tool vendors. Ouch. Oh, cancel that. That, that stings. As a tool vendor, ooh, that stings. Now, this was written way before I got into the static analysis area, but uh, criticism isn't entirely incorrect, right? And there were numbers backing this too. There's a link to the paper you can go check out the numbers in the methodology if you want. And then there was another one a few years later. Um, it came to a very similar conclusion. And I will highlight the section that's important. Taken together with Adam's observation that all modifications have a non-zero probability of introducing a fault, this makes it possible that adherence to the MISRA standard as a whole would have made the software less reliable. <laughs> so what they're saying here is that your tool finds a lot of violations of MISRA rules. So you have to go address those. And one way you address them is you fix them, you fix the code. But now you're changing all sorts of code, right? Now it turns out that those places where you fix that code may not have been actual problems. They may not have been defect, like they, they may not have caused a problem in your product. But here you are going and making changes that introduces a non-zero risk of making your product worse. Titus. We have unit tests. Yeah, changes to be embraced. So Titus's point is we have unit tests, right? So change the code. And if, if you broke something from changing the code, the tests will tell you. 
This is why you don't rely just on the Mr. Stand or on the standards. You, you can't do that, right? It will come back to bite you. Okay. And this is the one that I have the biggest problem with, productivity. So now I don't write software that, that drives cars, right? And so there's a certain productivity and safety risk that you have to balance, right? Um, in Michael's talk on, was that Monday, Michael? On Michael's talk on Monday, he showed videos of what happens whenever software uh, doesn't behave appropriately in systems that are safety critical, right? So in some cases, the productivity hit may be worth it, but the productivity hit for these things can be significant, okay? And it's hard to actually measure the return on investment on these things because it's like proving, it's, it's proving the contrary, right? What would have happened if we hadn't done this? It's, you know, hard to do. Yes? Mm -hmm. Right, you're jumping ahead on me. Okay. So he's, he's previewing a couple slides from now. So. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so then the question is, could the time spent doing that be, doing, be spent doing something else that pr produces a better product? Mm, we don't know. But let's look at what the productivity hit looks like. So <laughs> we've implemented this in our static analysis tool. In, at, at Synopsys, um, and we have tests, right? Any good software engineering or it has tests. So we run a test where we run MISRA C 2012 analysis over an old version of GDB, right? It runs like every night, right? And this is, it's gonna be hard to see maybe, but this is sort of a, a snippet of the output of the thing. So first off, it takes five minutes to run, Peter, so that's, that's good, it's not a 24 hour thing. Not five, not five milliseconds though. Um, we analyzed 719 files, there were 335,000 lines of code, you know, all this, all this data. The real important line here is 202,000 violations of MISRA C 2002, 2012 rules. So let's calculate that. Okay, our defect rate is 0 0.6 defects per line of code. So that means more than one out of every other line of code on average has a violation. Um, does anyone want to volunteer to go fix GDB and, and, and do all the MISRA, you know, do all the stuff MISRA for this? Okay, in case anybody thinks that they do, let's do some back of the napkin, you know, calculations. Oh, I forgot. Uh, if you have a violation, you don't have to go fix it. Instead, if there's a good reason for it, there's a thing called a deviation record that you can go fill out this deviation record to explain why, it's, why this one is okay, right? This is the example one provided by, by MISRA. Uh, you can see you have to actually you know, say you have to sign for it, right? Um, you've got lots of IDs you have to keep track of. You have to give some rationale. Um, but then, ah, sorry, two pages of text later, the example MISRA deviation record is two and a half pages long, right? So for every one of those deviations, you have two and a half pages of paperwork to fill out. Okay, so let's see what that actually results in. So um, that's uh, 505,000 pages that you're gonna have to, to uh, produce. Um, what happens if we actually try to print all that out? Um, so the width of a you know piece of paper is about that that much. So if you print it out after you after you've accumulated all this and you print it all out, you've got 25 meters a book that's 25 meters thick. Obviously, you would print it in volumes, right? So maybe you have uh, maybe you have 50 volumes, right? Okay. Uh, so you're, you're assuming here that every individual violation is a right. Right, if you want to take the easy way out and just say, you know what, our code's perfect. We're just gonna make a deviation for, for all of them. I'm saying, like, you might say, we're gonna deviate from this rule and there's a bunch of places in the code where that deviation applies to. Yes, so, yes, you wouldn't do this, nobody in their right mind would do this for every deviation, okay? But it's worse, maybe. So, 
So say though, for instance, say, just say we're, we've chosen to do the deviations, right? Uh, say you have tools that make creating these deviation records fast, right? I'm being generous here and saying it takes you six seconds to look, to, to, to look at the, the violation, determine that it's a deviate, that it, you should make a deviation, and use a tool to generate the deviation record. If, if in that very generous case, it's gonna take you 337 hours, working hours, to get through all of them. That's not, that's not too bad if you have a bunch of people working on it, right? But a more reasonable number, say it takes you 30 seconds, which is still, in my opinion, generous, to, to look at a piece of violation and go, yeah, I think we should mark that as a deviation. It's gonna take 1,684 hours to do all that, right? But then you go, well, but you probably don't have to type all this. Like, like tools will help you, there are other things that will help you. Uh, they're not gonna help you that much. Uh, and if you decide to actually go fix them, instead of making the deviation record, ah, now you have to change code, you have to compile that code, you have to test that code, you have to worry about maybe your tests weren't complete, right? This is a very serious problem, right? Uh, who wants to guess why this is a very serious problem? Anybody have? Taker, any takers? Yes. So you go and make these changes. So the, the, the comment was, he works in the aviation industry, so he, he's experienced with this problem, um, and your unit tests aren't gonna cover everything. Like, you, it can't, right? And he says it's a halting problem. Um, and so making all these changes is dangerous, but, to, but you have to do something about it. The, the, to be compliant, you have to take an action, right? My contention is that um, GDB um, is not critical for crit safety critical applications, right? We're applying the wrong standard guideline to the wrong project, right? It shouldn't be applicable here. Uh, the other thing is it's much easier if you start with a new code base and you're applying them and can keep them managed instead of taking an existing project and being like, well, let's see what the violations are. It has its own problems, but. So, you know, tools can help, but there's still some problems even with tools that are helping. So, we all pay a price here. So, uh, the analysis time, which already analysis almost always takes significantly longer than just compilation, right? Because we're doing more work. But whenever you add in these new rules to, to check most of these rules, you have to actually accumulate a lot more information than you would have to for most static analysis defects, right? So we have to spend a lot more time collecting information and analyzing that information to be able to provide the, the, the violations. So you can expect two or three times longer than the normal analysis will take if, if you do this. That's, that's not good. Now you're looking at you know, maybe 10 times your build time. And there's opportunity costs. There's opportunity costs for you as the users, but there's also opportunity costs for the tool developers. Maybe you're writing your own tool for, for your guidelines internally, right? The time that is spent writing the tools to help verify the guidelines is time that could be spent doing other things. So, you have to make trade off you have to make decisions about what's valuable or not. And while it seems like that might be easy, it's actually really hard to decide what's valuable enough to spend time on. Okay, so we've got, um, let's see, how many more minutes? 10 minutes left. Uh, so let's go through some conclusions uh, real quick. I, sh I should say, there are some really good coding guidelines out there. Even the ones that I personally don't like, there are good parts to them. Okay, I've yet to find a coding guideline that is not fake, that I just hate every part of it, right? So some conclusions. Make an informed choice, right? Don't just pick 
Google C++ style guy, well, because, well, Google's big, and I guess they know what they're doing, right? They do. But the deal is that Google has very specific problems for their organization that they are trying to solve with those guidelines. And you may have similar concerns. If you think you do, I would suggest that you go talk to Titus, <laughs> and he may potentially disabuse you of those notions, okay? So think about the choice before you just pick one. When you're choosing a guideline, look at more than one, right? And consider forking an existing guideline. Forking the guideline allows you to control the update cycle for, for your guidelines, right? It allows you to react as quickly as you want to. Um, and examining multiple of them gives you some perspective. It gives you different arguments for the different rules. And then you can decide which ones fit your context better. Guidelines are not a replacement for proper training. In fact, it can make it worse, right? You have to train the, the people in your organization to do the right things. The guidelines are useful as a shortcut, but you can't just give them the shortcut and expect them to be consistently applying those in a smart way. You have to teach them. They're not a replacement for solid code review process. Now, this is where um, I kind of deviate. This is actually more like something you would find in a guideline for behavioral prescription, right? But I believe in code review process, right? If you're not doing it, you should, you should add it into your guideline to do code review process. It's not a replacement for automated testing. Same deal. Use the tools to automate the guidelines that don't take a lot of thought, right, to, to, to know, oh, this is the right thing to do. The perfect example of this is formatting braces and, and line width and spaces and how function signatures look. We have tools to do this. Use those. There are probably some other areas where you can find um, tools that will help you enforce the guidelines. Some static analysis is in a different category. We're trying to think through the problems with static analysis, so those are for deeper things. Guidelines should avoid inventing terminology that are not in the standard or that are not de facto standards in the community. This is a significant problem for implementers. If, if, if we're writing a tool to help check guideline rules and we come across a term that's ambiguous or it has some definition that exists just in the guideline, now we have to go understand what that term means in the context of the standard of, of, of actual compilers, right? So the classic example is two years ago at CppCon, or the classic, my classic example, is two years at CppCon, I gave a talk on function default arguments. Um, and the reason that came about is because there are rules that say um, for virtual functions, the function default arguments on any parameters must be the same with no explanation of what same means. Does it mean lexically the same? Does it mean same equality? Does it mean identity? No explanation, right? So if you're writing guidelines and you find yourself trying to, you need to use terms to describe relationships between things, look at the standards terminology for, for guidance. Define a process to regularly review and update your guidelines and perform that process religiously, right? If you go a whole year without updating your guidelines, your guidelines are stale, right? Vice versa, you don't wanna talk about it every day, right? So you need to define some process to improve, call out old rules that are no longer valid, that fit your organization, and your organization may have a single person that's the, that's the benevolent dictator that decides these things. It might have a committee of people, of experienced engineers that are doing it. Um, you might have, this would be a bad one, but you might have a random selection <laughs> of guidelines, you know, but at least there's a process for, for getting change in there. Okay, 
So that's the, that's the end of the main content. I think I have some extra slides if we have time, but now's a good time for if people had questions that they, they still need answered, uh, it'd be a good time for that. Um, I would say, don't, don't worry about using the mic. Just ask, just ask me and then I'll repeat it. It's just easier. All right, Peter. Do you have a different question or the one you wanted to come back to? Okay, go ahead. So uh, the underlying question is, the quick feedback helps a lot to avoid getting into the subsequent cloud migrations. And uh, I try hard in all my students and with my tooling stuff that we create across the last more than decade mm -hmm. uh, to get immediate feedback and also provide rules to remedy. Right. And that seems to be something that's not very appreciated. I right. Myself. Right. And the question is, do you think that's wrong, or do right. you think people just don't get it? So, so to, to remind everybody what the context of this question is. So, um, Peter's a teacher. He's an instructor at the university. Uh, he's got students, and he wants he wants them to use stack analysis in their projects because it's a good practice, right? But the problem is, you submit your you you commit. It, automated builds happen. Uh, and then sometime the next day, you get an email that says, hey, I found some, some violations. Well, no. What, what we do, we give immediate feedback in the IDE message. Okay, right. So the problem is that traditionally, a lot of tools have this really long latency between push and feedback. And that makes it really hard then to actually address those problems. And so, yes, you're right. Tools should be trying to provide faster feedback. And uh, at Synopsys, we have some tools that help, that we're, we're, we're improving on that, right? So we have IDE plugins that uh, will give you more immediate feedback in the IDE as you're, as you're doing your flow, right? Um, I think Microsoft static analysis tools are doing very similar things. So I think that the state of art is improving there to the point where we'll be able to use static analysis results uh, closer to the point of introduction of, of, of the issue. Does that, does that answer your question? I think it's a good thing, too. I'm not sure how to answer it. Oh, you failed to make that pop more popular, and should we try to make it more popular? Sorry. Um, I mean, I think that I think organizations that are making tools are aware of the problem and are trying to work on it, but maybe it's not going fast enough. I think I have a quick answer to yes, that. Yes, Valentin. Hi. Uh, I was one of the people you mentioned. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in our organization, we value the the code. Everything has to be code, right? So, uh, I know what you mean, and it's important to have them in uh, IDE, but it's also important to make sure they don't go into production, right? So, a good process would be pre-commit, like have checks right at the moment where you're supposed to commit mm -hmm. that you run the validation. You have right. the CI solution, run some rules, and maybe you elevate those rules as errors. Right. So literally, the code won't won't go in right. mainline if right. it, if it uh, right. you know contradicts the the guideline. Right. So what Valentin is 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 offering is a gated check-in type of solution. And and gated check-ins are great. They're a great uh, part of the process for continuous integration. Charles. Mm -hmm. And people will come to me and say, Charles, what does this message from Coverity actually mean? Yeah. And this is right up there with template error messages. Uh -huh. um, it's wonderful for those of us who actually read guidelines right. because we have trouble sleeping. Right. But <laughs> right. So, right. So the, the feedback here is um, oftentimes messages you get back from tools like static, static analyzers can be hard to decipher and understand. Um, and what I would say is, if you're experiencing that, it is perfectly valid to contact your vendor and say, this makes no sense. Improve the, the output for this. Bryce. I do think, uh, I think at scale, it's not and always realistic to gate uh, a check-in on 100% uh, yeah. pass and static analysis. Because right. if, you, if, you have, if it's a thing where you need to go request for a deviation, um, I don't know yeah. the rest of you, but my company, we have we have like 15 people that are on our deviation committee, but we're 
very much underwater. So yeah. we don't have we can't we can't hold back people from right. leaving their code for weeks because right. they're, so, they're doing paperwork. So so Bryce's feedback here is in sort of response to the gated check in yeah. kind of approach that sometimes it's just not feasible. I mean, you, you can't you can't wait weeks and weeks and weeks. Do it, but you you shouldn't necessarily block check ins on this. Right. You shouldn't necessarily block check ins on this. Um, I do want to get to one extra slide now that Titus came back. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, some extras. Uh, so is the ISO C++ standard a coding guideline? So when, when, when this came up in Nico's talk earlier, I, I looked around the room for any standards committee members to see what their reaction was. I saw some people going, no, and some people going, yes. Okay, so uh, of course it is, it's a standard, right? Uh, oh, no, no, it's a standard for C++. It is not a standard for how to write C++, um, except that we can be implicit guidelines that people can derive from the things that are in there. Um, oh, but there's actually a paper to go make a guideline for, for the standard as a standing document. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it might end up being an actual coding guideline. You may not need to use it. The context of it is the C++ standard. So unless you're the C++ standard, maybe you shouldn't use that guideline. Okay, um, and then I'll leave this one. People can come talk to me later. Should there be an official catalog of published guidelines available to the industry? That's an open question. Find me later and we can chat about it. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, it's been great.